on and manipulate and do whatever it was that I needed to do. I was always in search of that ever elusive feeling. I was always in search of something that would give me on a permanent basis what alcohol would give me on a temporary basis. Every door marked no by society's standards, I ran to it, I threw the door open and I tried it. I began burning my life to the ground at a very early age. I was just like 90% of the people I would guess in this room, I was full of potential. At 17 years old, um, I had entered a contest and had won and had a commercial that I had written. I had actually had it produced and it was on television um, at 17 years old. You know, and I had, it had been noticed by a local advertising company in the capital of Ohio and they offered me a summer internship when I got out of high school to come work for them and I told them no thanks. Because see, the internship was for free. I wouldn't make any money. And I already knew at 17 years old I needed money to keep doing what I was doing. So I said no thank you to probably an incredible, bright, amazing career in advertising and kept my job at the shoe department at a local discount store making minimum wage. And that was at 17. And then a couple years later, a family member that saw me burn in my life to the ground tried to intervene. I had had another dream of going to college and becoming an attorney, just like my grand sponsor. And so he did what he needed to do. and. Um, I found out very quickly that it was a whole lot easier to break the law than it was to study it. Um, so I gave, on that, gave up on that rapidly too. Somewhere along the lines during this course of time, I got convinced that what would fix what was broken in me was going to be the right relationship. Now, I got to tell you, I had no idea that my drinking was already a problem, and I had no idea what a good relationship looked like. I had never been in one, nor had I even witnessed one. When you shake my family tree, bottles fall out, not long-term marriages. So, um, you know, I really do not know what, where I got this idea. And my relationships at this time, to give you a snapshot of what they looked like, you know, it's Friday night, we both have been drinking for a few hours, we're in the living room of my apartment, and I am that psycho chick that some of you guys probably, I would imagine, have dated. One minute, we are very intimate, and the next minute, I am screaming at you. And I'm saying, I hate you, get out of my life, you dirty, rotten... You have no idea what you've done, and I may not have any idea either. I am just screaming because I snap just like that, that Jekyll and Hyde personality. And I'm screaming at you, and I say, I hate you. Get out of my life. I don't ever want to see you again. And then before your car has backed itself all the way out of the parking place from in front of my apartment, I have now thrown myself, spread eagle, superhero style on the hood of your car, and I'm screaming, why are you leaving me? I love you. And I can't figure out why you guys always left. Honestly, it took till my second inventory to find out what the root cause of that problem was. You know, I always tell people, um, by the time I got into AA at 33 years old, I had been married and divorced three times. I intuitively know how to get married. It's the staying part I find baffling. Our traditions relationship guy this afternoon seemed to have the same trouble. So, we, um, it was great. We just, you know, I was always looking for that right relationship to fix me. And what I learned was through strong sponsorship. I learned some things about that experience. I learned that it had been my alcoholic self-will. It had been another manifestation of my alcoholism, looking for something to fill that emptiness inside of me that had gotten me into each and every one of those situations. But it was the grace of a loving God that had gotten me out alive. Because some of them were very, very dangerous positions. I also learned that we don't attract what we want. We attract what we are. And I hope with all of my heart and soul today that that is the truth. Because the gentleman that came with me today that's sitting here in the front row, my biggest fan, um, is the most amazing, gracious, 
strong, kind, and compassionate person I have ever met in my life. And I am so blessed to have him. So I certainly hope we attract what we are, not what we want. But the most important lesson that I learned from those ladies was that I had been right all along. It would be the right relationship that would fix me. I just had my wrong partner. See, my partner, my number one partner, had to be a power greater than human aid. My number one partner had to be with a power greater than myself, greater than human aid. I had just been looking in the wrong place the whole time. An amazing thing happened. When I made that my number one partner, all of the people that weren't supposed to be in my life pretty quietly left. The people that were supposed to be in my life, it was if somebody opened a floodgate and they literally just poured into my life. And I am ever so grateful for that. But at this point in time in my drinking in my 20s, um, the last gentleman that I pulled into my alcoholic pit of insanity was a very successful businessman. I had bought into society's lie that I j if I just get all the stuff that's what it'll take to make me happy, joyous, and free. And he had all the stuff. And as I said, he was a very successful businessman, and so we would have to go to these little cocktail parties. And I don't know if any of you have ever been to those delights. They are more fun for an alcoholic. Because um, what happens is they hand you a little plastic four-ounce cup. Somebody fills it full of ice cubes. They wave a liquor bottle over the top of it. And the fumes that fall in, they call it a drink. Now... I am living under the illusion at that time our book talks about that I can drink like a normal person. So I get that little drink, I'm full of self-centered fear and self-pity, I take a sip, I get that alcohol into my system, I know now I have an allergy to that alcohol which kicks off a symptom of a phenomenon of craving. And all of a sudden my head just is off and running. And that little hamster that I told you about, he used to come and visit me on those nights. And he would come to me as I'm standing there in front of a room full of people and he'd say, you know, you can get past him and over there at that bar and get that whole bottle of whiskey and you can take it back in the bathroom and you can drink that whole bottle of whiskey down, but you better get a two liter bottle of pop to refill that bottle of whiskey because you don't want anybody else to see you. And here I am standing there in this business cocktail party like this, having a conversation with a hamster in my head thinking it's perfectly normal. I have no idea I'm dying of untreated alcoholism already. But I did learn some social graces at that time. I learned that when you're full of self-centered fear and self-pity at a business cocktail party, if you crush one of those little plastic arms or those plastic cups in your hand and liquor runs down your arm, that it is socially unacceptable to go like this. <laughs> and lick it off. Total class, I know. Um, that's why they put me in the middle of the afternoon. <laughs> now, I had my last finger in my mouth because, you know, you got to get what's under the fingernail. You can't let a drop go, right? And that's when I saw him, the husband. Now, his face was bright red. That vein that you men have in your forehead that we women have the ability to make appear at a moment's notice, it looked like a Bugs Bunny cartoon. It was like boom, boom. And I said my first ever sincere prayer then. And it was, dear God, please let his head explode because I don't know how to get out of this. That was literally the best I had at that point in my life. See, I was not born with this filter that normal people had that said, that might not be a good idea. You might not want to do that. Whatever came to my mind right then, I just did it. And then what happened was I would spend the next hour, the next day, or the next decade trying to figure out how to undo what it was that I did. You know, it's no wonder we come in here exhausted. Absolutely no wonder at all. But you know, I'm a good alcoholic, so I got home. That isn't going to stop me. I'm not invited to any more business cocktail parties, but that's okay because I'm a good alcoholic. I've always got a plan. Not only am I living under that illusion our book talks about, I'm living under that delusion our book talks about, that I can wrest satisfaction and happiness out of this world if I just manage well. So I go down my list. I got the him, I got the house, I got the stuff, and I, I'm, I'm still losing my mind. What could possibly be missing? I have absolutely no concept I am dying of untreated alcoholism. Absolutely none at all. The only thing that I could come up with that I didn't have in my life at that time was a baby. So that's exactly what I did was I brought a baby into this world to fix what was broken inside of me. 
And what I learned shortly after his birth was that a baby's shoulders are entirely too tiny to carry the disease of alcoholism on, much less a program of recovery. I thought I would give birth to that little boy and everything would be fine, but everything wasn't fine. Everything just got intense. It was as if somebody had walked in during the night and ripped my eyelids off, and I'm like this, and the entire world is just coming at me. I have absolutely no tools in which to deal with it, absolutely none at all. My best thinking, my best plans, my last idea, trying to stay sober on my own because, see, I didn't want to be that mom like I had grown up with, got me locked up in a psychiatric unit under a suicide watch, with papers that said I was a threat to myself and society, including that little boy that I brought into this world to fix me. See, that's how I react when I try and stay sober on my own. I was eventually released into my husband's care. He couldn't take living with me very much longer. Um, just couldn't take living with a dry alcoholic without a program because see what happens when I'm just not drinking? and I don't have a sufficient substitute, my character defects literally rule my life. I, am, I don't know if you guys have Verizon telephone down here, but I'm like that little guy on the Verizon commercial. Can you hear me now? 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 I will not cut you a break at any time in any way, shape, or form because I am once again depending on you, someone from outside of me, to fix what is broken inside of me. And if you don't respond to my needs instantly, see, I grew up in a home of he who yelled the loudest one. So if you don't respond in the way I think you should, I get more aggressive and I get more abrasive. And I finally run you right out of my life. And the only other tool that I have in my toolkit for the kind of angst I feel is alcohol. So that's exactly what I did. I climbed right back into the bottle. I can't tell you if I had a conscious thought whether to do it or not. If I did, I'm sure what it would have said was, see, I wasn't drinking and he still left. Obviously, alcohol wasn't the problem he was. Crack it open, pour it down, I think all my problems are solved. I'm looking for a little relief, but what happens instead is I awaken a beast inside of me that I didn't even know existed. Instead of getting a little relief, I get a new level of powerless and unmanageability with the likes I had never known before. I am completely unable to be present in my own life. You guys know what happens to people like us. You know, I want to be a good member of society. I want to be a good girlfriend even at that point. But I'm incapable of giving something that I don't have. So I'm trading my body and my soul for a night of just trying to feel loved. And you guys know what happens. I wake up with guilt, shame, and remorse, so I gotta drink more. I'm trying to show up at work and be a good employee, but I can't do that anymore because I'm in the throes of alcoholism, so the money's not coming in like it should be, which then affects the one thing I always promised I would never do. See, I always promised myself I would be a good mom. But when the money's not coming in like it should be, and my alcoholism now has...